Thank you very much. And a special thanks to ma'am. Uh, in fact, uh, she is the person who actually that time I was in US. Recently, I came back uh, completing my first phase of Fulbright as Lex Awardee. So ma'am talked to me and asked me to, to deliver a lecture in this. So I'm thankful to her as well as to Dr. Ranjit and the entire team, the participants. Uh, it's a privilege always to discuss and to share views from young to the very experienced persons in our Indian platform of knowledge sharing. So today, uh, in fact, earlier I, I planned to talk about half an hour as was given uh, in the schedule. So I was more confined to, to Innocence Project, particularly deal how to deal wrongful conviction and all, because this was the topic which is, was very close to me since last couple of years. And I was fortunate to get Fulbright Fellowship where I could ponder my knowledge on this subject by interacting more than 100 stakeholders, the experts, judiciary, and many more across US in last nearly three months or so. So I will try to, to share my presentation and I hope it is visible now. Ma'am, ma yes, sir. Ma yes, sir, it is visible, sir. Yeah, so this is a little longer uh, presentation. So I will rush through for half an hour. Few slides I will skip because uh, my focus would be more on 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 innocence project but this whole <clears throat> presentation will set the tone so half an hour i will try to uh, discuss this presentation and then half an hour i will discuss on innocence project and rest 15 minutes we will have some question answer session although if anybody has any question at any point of time i don't mind to to attend okay so as everybody knows that investigation is very, very important part of criminal justice system and evidence are the fulcrum to deliver justice because evidence are the baseline which explores the truth behind a fact. So evidence find truth and truth is the basis of justice. So evidence, truth and justice. These are the triangle which has very important role to uh, play what we are going to discuss today. So before we enter the role of forensics, let us just see this slide. Just a minute, I will, okay, yeah. Sir, my humble request, if you can, uh, yes, sir, perfect, fine, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah. So if you see why we need forensic science, what is the need? So I will try to give you some kind of input on that. So if you see, these are the rape incidents right from 2014 to 2019. So police file charge sheet in nearly 80, 85%, 90% cases. But if we see the conviction, conviction is roughly 30%. So there is gap of nearly 60% cases. Police feel that we have done our job, <clears throat> but when the case goes to court for trial, court says that, look, your evidence are not sufficient. So here is the gap. So how to fill this gap is, is a real challenge. And we'll see at the end that how we can fill this gap of 60%. Similarly, in case of POXO, POXO Act, if you know, was brought in by Indian government to, to align our, our uh, laws with UNCRC, United Nations Convention on Child Rights, 1989. So we brought POXO Act 2012 on 14th November 2012. So here the scenario is almost same. Police file charge sheet in nearly 90 to 95% cases but conviction is hardly 30 to 35%. Again, the business of nearly 60% cases remain challenge. We, police file charge sheet, but they turn into acquittals. So this is a problem. We have to find some solution of this. 
and this is not the case only in even in human trafficking you must be aware that human trafficking is bundle of crime whether it is sex, sexual abuse maybe labor maybe organ organ transplant so many cases so human trafficking is really a big challenge and as chief of ats i have seen that how people have been trafficked from various parts of globe uh, and in india is a transit route in various manners here also char sheet if you see the central part char sheet in nearly 89% cases but conviction is again 20 to 30% so this remains almost the 60% business remain core area where we have to ponder and we have to find some solution sexual offense as you know are very important so let me just give you some kind of understanding about sexual violence before we reach to our discussion because because this time management has changed my orientation earlier i was just focus on innocence but i will bring it that in the end so what is sexual offense we see in our indian scenario we have two major segment one part is harassment and harassment is dealt under section 354 and 509 and uh, however sexual assault is dealt is is be uh, the rape is defined under section 375 of penal code and punishment is encompassed under section 376 so this slide which you are seeing i prepared probably in 2017 or 18 when hashtag me too was in discussion and there was a proposition that in old cases we cannot prove the allegation beyond reasonable doubt like in criminal cases so there was one thought that can we deal such allegations as civil remedy where we need preponderance of probability so this is how the sexual offense are being dealt in india so this is something like what we did after nirbhaya case we brought criminal amendment act 2013 and another act which is least discussed uh, by by even uh, under academic scenario the sexual harassment act at workplace 2013 these two acts are very very important and these are the water said actually in rape jurisprudence in india and sexual harassment cases so if we look what were the changes made by amendment act 2013 so the definition of rape was broader this is the crux and if you look closely you will find that sexual offense act 2003 of united kingdom has grave impact on our act 2013 and what we did we widen the definition beyond pino vaginal penetration earlier the rape definition was confined to penetration or attempt to penetration of pino vaginal penetration right but now it is any body part or object for inserting or trying to insert or to penetrate any orifice it may be female uh, part it may be anus it may be mouth but the the intent of penetration must be sexual in nature this is again the intent word is very very difficult to define it has not been defined but forget about this part let me talk about the collection of evidence but the problem arise after this rape definition was widened <clears throat> you know what we do in rape cases normally we conduct two things number one medical legal injuries we try to find out on the body of the victim medical legal injuries sometime even the accused also being tested for medical legal injuries right second we generally try to collect different swabs as well as any kind of you know maybe uh, any any biological content you can say maybe semen maybe blood maybe saliva maybe nail clips the skin remnants and so on and so forth but if you see the definition suppose somebody somebody alleges that this man had inserted finger into my private part are we really able 
or whether our forensic science is that much evolved that can we collect evidence forensically from such allegations? The answer is no. So I mean to say that we have expanded the definition, but corresponding forensic tools have been have not been provided. So here is the gap, and we need a lot of R&D, research and development in this area. I strongly believe as a student of law, as well as a professional police officer, that merely by giving any legal tool may not be enough until unless we provide corresponding evidentiary tool. So this is a very, very important part. And during my visit to US, I found that most of the time, whenever they bring any legislation, generally they also consider that how the evidence will, would be collected. So that is that gap we have to look at. Now, in case of investigation of sexual offense, these are the broad challenges. Delay in FIR. In case there is an inordinate delay, then the defense will definitely take advantage. So in case of any sexual offense or any case for that matter, the FIR or the first information report must be submitted at earliest possible because unwanted delay, undue delay will create doubt in the mind of the court. Then consent in sexual offense. You know, a minor, maybe a boy or a girl, if it is, if she or he is minor, then it is called committed, uh, you can say, statutory rape or statutory sexual offense. So in minor cases, the, the consent of the victim does not matter at all, right? But many times you will see that in case of ma when the age of girl is 16 or 17, then determination of age becomes very, very important, especially in case when there is no record, like any birth certificate or something like that. I will talk in the next slide uh, how to determine age. That is a very, very big challenge. Then another comes the sole testimony. You know, my dear friends, that in case of sexual offense, you would hardly find any eyewitness. Very, very rare cases. Maybe in some, some cases, like in child sexual abuse or something, but otherwise. So you have to rely on sole testimony of the victim. So what is sole testimony? I will discuss in the later phase. Then you need to have some corroboration because can you just believe what the, the prosecutrix or the victim says? Answer is no, not always. So there is a need of corroboration, corroboration of facts. So what are the tools for corroboration? There comes the role of forensics. So forensic science is a, is a, a tool which provide you the corroborative evidence. So this is the link of forensic science with our justice system. So sole testimony, sole testimony as I already mentioned that you have to believe the victim. Normally in our society, whether it is police or even the common people, Generally, whenever there, there is a, a rape allegation or sexual abuse allegation, first response is denial. Generally, people used to say, no, there must be something else. There may be some personal relationship and something, blah, blah, blah. I always advocate that until unless you prove this fact that there was some, some consensual uh, sexual liaison or something, don't jump to conclusion right in the beginning. So first you investigate and then uh, reach to conclusion rather than in the beginning itself. But unfortunately, this is the scenario. So this sole testimony is a very sacrosanct uh, doctrine in India. And it had been discussed by Vivian Bose, Justice Vivian Bose in Rameswar case. Then in Hizri Bai case, which, is the, which, which was delivered by Supreme Court in 1983. It is very, very important. I will just like to read this these few lines so that you can understand better. Corroboration is not the sine qua non for a conviction in a rape. That means corroboration is not required. You can solely depend on what the, the victim says, but you have to test one thing. 
whether the, the testimony of the prosecutrix is reliable. Here is the catch. This reliability is very, very difficult to prove. So this statement of the Supreme Court does not mean that you do not have to corroborate. It says that you should not deny have an issue, but it does not stop you for corroboration. This is the point. And those who have more interest to read this doctrine, they may also see the judgment Vijay Elias Chini. This is also a very important case of 2010 by the Apex Court of India. These are some defense plea. I will just skip because I am not going to talk here the POXO Act, that how the inordinate delay, majority of age and all, how how they can countermand the, 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 the case of prosecution in POXO cases. So these are very important defense plea, but because of paucity of time, I'm just skipping. Now, as I mentioned that age determination is very important. And I, if, I, if I get time, I will talk in, in Innocence Project also. Interestingly, we have made a lot of amendments in POXO Act, but can you just imagine that even age determination, the procedure of age determination is missing still in POXO Act. I'm surprised to know this. You know, POXO Act, the very first thing for the prosecution to set up is the age. And how to determine age is still missing from the Act. This is very surprising. And this very issue was raised in Jarnel Singh versus the state of Haryana. Just immediately, the POXO Act came into existence. In 2013, the Supreme Court observed that until LLS, POXO Act is empowered by its own method of age determination. We have to use Rule 12 of Ju Juvenile Justice Act of 2007. My dear friends, this JJ Act has been totally repealed and now we have new JJ Act 2015 and what came into existence in 2016. It's section 94 has clear cut uh, procedure to determine age of the juvenile, right? Because juvenile, whether on the other side, whether it is victim or accused does not matter because juvenile is juvenile. So that method can be applied in POXO Act. So what does it say? So this is very important to understand. <coughs> If there is any question of age, then you have to see first matriculation certificate. If child is, is, is of younger age, may not be have matriculation completed, then, or there may be a person who may not have gone to matriculation. In absence of certif matriculation certificate, the second option is date of birth from any school. If it is not available, then certificate by corporation or any panchayat or village panchayat, something like that. If all three are not available, then only you can go for medical opinion. Mind it, this is a sequence. And I have seen as a police officer violating it day in and day out by police, by investigating agency. So, so this fourth one has a lot of problem. You just cannot determine age by bone ossification or X-ray X -ray analysis because the, the calcification and other things are not uniform, not uni, uh, universally acceptable. That means depending upon, a, uh, depending upon calcium content and many other things, ossification rate is different. So this has plus minus two year difference, plus minus two. And suppose if a girl is 17 years, so plus two, that means 19. So medical report says that C may be either 15 or maybe 19. And benefit of doubt goes to the accused. Once C get benefited, uh, he get benefited, then your entire case is gone. I have seen such cases. Interestingly, this is this case what I am referring is from, from Bareilly. Can you believe that defense could prove that child is major, major, right? Suppose if it happens, then it should be shifted to 376 section. And that case, unfortunately, was dropped. 
I don't know what prosecution was doing, what honorable judge was doing, but this is the gross reality. So such type of gross injustice are happening in our country day in and day out. Another important point, which is a very, very tricky position. Even if you have birth certificate, even if you have date of birth certificate in school, right? This section 35 of Indian Evidence Act creates a lot of trouble, especially to those whose parents are <coughs> illiterate, may not be much aware, particularly from marginalized society, because the defense will ask that, look, your date of birth is written, say, for example, 8 October 2005. They say, what is October? When does it October comes? So poor people, those who are unaware, are not being able to explain. And that creates doubt in the mind of the court and benefit goes to the accused. So all these things putting together, the, the justice system needs a little bit more concern and overhaul. And if this type of scenario, which I am talking, if you are interested to see, you can look at the Sikkim versus Girjamani Rai alias Kami. This case of 2019 can empower you more knowledge on this subject. These are some important cases on rape jurisprudence. Mathura case very important where uh, Professor Upendra Bakshi has written an open letter which was not even published in India. It was published by pa Pakistan press. Subsequently, it was also brought in the knowledge in, in Indian, uh, Indian population. And you might be aware that Amendment Act 1983 was basically based on his latter. Kuljit Singh case, Ranga Billa, very important, Dhananjay. All cases are very important, but because of paucity of time, I don't want to take yeah. much of time. Nirbhaya case, I sincerely request you to have a look on Anokhilal case. Here, interestingly, you might be knowing that delayed justice, denied justice, but this case says that hurried justice, buried justice. So, these are important cases. And this another case, the last one, which is mentioned here in reassessment of criminal case. This is started in 2019 on the same day that was December 18 of 2019 when Anokhilya Lal case was discussed. And this case is a very progressive case. Probably when this judgment will come, it will turn around the jurisprudence of rape. It is basically assessment on various points of rape jurisprudence. So this case, those who have interest can follow this case. These are more important cases on child sexual abuse. I will just skip. Now, investigation. My dear friends, investigation needs procedural fairness. You might be knowing three ingredients of law. JRF, law, first ingredient is that law, anything is legal. If it is, it emanates justice. Number two, reasonable. If anything is reasonable, it can be lawful. If it is not reasonable, it is illogical, then cannot be legal. The third one is fairness. If it is fair, transparent, unbiased, then only your, your action or inaction may be justified or it may be legal. So JRF, you always remember that these are the three yardstick how legality of any statute is being measured by even the Supreme Court or by any court who are reviewing any law. So, dear friends, another important point with my own understanding that what we do in investigation, we are actually revolving around human identification, one way or other. If we, even if FIR is named, then also we are proving that the person who is alleged is the right person as an accused. So that is also human identification. On other side, if victim is unidentified, sometimes maybe live child, but does not know who or who he or she is. And sometimes you get dead body of the victim, may not be identified by morphological features. You may get sometimes bone or body remains. So human identification become very, very centric to your criminal investigation. For that, we use morphological features, photography, sketch, videography, fingerprints, seriology, 
where sample DNA and so many other things. And DNA is the most important part. <coughs> Sorry. Now, these are some important point. What is investigation? Investigation is basically pursuit of truth. And we need to have fairness in investigation, procedural fairness. And I think this is very important, this fairness business. Unfortunately, we watch up invest investigation just to secure conviction. I think this is a very, very wrong preposition. Neutrality of, of, of investigation, investigator is very essential because we are adver adversarial criminal justice system. Basically, judge act as a, as a neutral empire and both sides, prosecution as well as defense, they contest based on argumentation, right? So these are very important point and as, uh, in the right down, you might be seeing the Innocence Project. I will be talking little more about this in, in next 15 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes. So these are the witness. Normally, friends, the primary witness is considered the eyewitness because he can de describe what he or she has seen as eyewitness. So he is the star witness. But you might be knowing that eyewitness always have challenge. They may be planted. They may have some personal vendetta. There may be hostility. There may be vision impairment, some difficulties to see. There may be so many challenge for eyewitness even. Right. So what is the, the way out? The way out is what somebody says, you have to corroborate. So corroboration is very, very important part. And I have seen very few cases where without corroboration, you can reach out to the truth. These are about the corroboration. What corroboration is, these are some important judgments. And particularly, if you want to, to read more about that, that Holland case of 1954 is very important uh, of United States. And in India, these punch sila were being given in Sarat Birdi Chand case as old as in 1984. However, in 2020, Satish Kumar, Pilhad Vasnik, many cases are important to read. Those who have interest, I can share these slides, can see that. This case, Vesnav, those five punch seal that I mentioned in previous case, they have been reduced to three. And now this case is also very celebrated case for knowing what corroboration is. Now let me just enter into the domain of forensic science. Forensic science is basically a fusion science. It is a blend science. It is a hybrid science. It is not like physics, chemistry, mathematics. It is a hybrid of scientific domain as well as social science domain, right? So forensic science gives scientific temper to evidence. And it is baseline for scientific investigation by which we can enhance probity of evidence. And the entire objective is to march towards perfect justice. It is generally said that judge deliver justice. It is your good luck if you get, judge deliver judgment. It is your good luck if you get justice. So that justice should be perfect. You need to have some corroborative evidence and forensic science may be one very important for that purpose. These are some developmental aspect. I'll just skip because I told you time is less. And here, I don't know whether I should take up, but this slide give you the constitutional aspect of investigation. And my dear friends, I don't go for detail, but I will just give you what exactly is the investigation and how can you do that, right? You might be aware about Article 20, Part three, self-incrimination or testimonial compulsion. That means that nobody can be compelled to be witness against himself. In other words, you can say that nobody can be compelled to admit guilt. So confession is not be imposed. It should be totally voluntary, right? But you might be knowing or you have heard everybody of us almost know that what is third degree. Third degree means use of violence by investigating agency. This LEA means Law Enforcement Agency. 
So we know that third degree is there. Police or any law enforcement agency sometime resort to violence in order to get evidence or to know the facts, right? But the question arises, if there is third degree, there must be first and second degree. And I think if we understand this first and second degree, then we can understand where the scientific investigation lies. Normally, when we are one-to-one, face-to-face, -to -face, generally I ask, what do you mean by first and second degree? You can ask this question by your own, whether you can answer. And I think it is very important because first degree and second degree, I have at least not found in any literature. And in one of my article, I think in 2016 or 17, I have attempted to answer this question. And later, that reference had been cited in, by many, uh, many criminologists and many uh, generals later. So let us understand what is first and second degree. So first, second, and third are the statistical values. And degree is quantification. What is quantification? Quantification of torture. And my dear friends, torture is two types. First degree and uh, torture is, is of two types. One is mental, another is physical. So as you know, physical torture is completely proscribed. It is not being permitted under law, right? So now you only left with mental torture. So understand what I mean to say by this example. Suppose a person got a phone call or got a notice from a police station or maybe CBI or any law enforcement agency saying that you come on a particular date to police station or to any office. Even if that person does not have any linkage or any connection, any concern about any crime, what he will feel? He will feel torture, mental torture. Now he or she goes to the police or to law enforcement agency. Normal questions are being asked. What is your name? Who is your father? Where from you belongs to? What is your education? What do you know about the crime? and this and that. Up to this level, my dear friends, it is first degree. The moment the law enforcement person start confrontation, confrontation of the facts, here is the second degree. And my dear friends, second degree, that confrontation of facts is the real investigation. How to do about that? The, you as an investigator must be aware about the facts. You must prepare a questionnaire. In case those questionnaires need some modification while you are interrogating a person or examining a person, you must know how to modify those questions. So it is a systematic approach basically for confrontation of the facts. Here lies the scientific temper and those who do not know that, they just go start examining, have no preparation, and then they resort to third degree. So if you really want to avoid third degree, then give emphasis on second degree. These four cases which are written, Kathi Kallu Ogar, probably many of you may be knowing about the fingerprint, then Nandini Satpathi, it provide you right to silence. Article 19 provide you right to speak, but article, article 90, uh, article 20, part three provide you right not to speak. Then Selvi, everybody knows about deception detection technique, the narco analysis and all. Ritesh Sina becomes very important for the purpose of bias matching. These are some right to privacy. I'm just skipping because of time and all. So I think now, yes, this slide is very important because it will provide you. Now let me talk about what exactly is the requirement for a forensic evidence. And I will build up my you know, discussion on this slide broadly. Suppose somebody comes to your court or to you and claim that, see, I have invented this technique. Please use it for courtroom proceedings as, a, as an evidence. Can you do that? The answer is no. Why? you have to go for some test. And those two tests are important. Both were brought by US Supreme Court. First, the name of the first case is Prior Test, 
F R Y E test in 1921 and in 23 that is called uh, 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 that that case that uh, uh, that test is basically uh, depend on how the scientific community react to that particular case. If all scientific community believe that this is a test which is which is acceptable, then court will accept. So onus goes to the scientific community, right? But later it was realized that suppose if something is wrong, and I will tell you when I will talk about Innocence Project, that suppose if something wrong is, mis is, is spreading, can court shut its, its eyes? Can court be blind? Then comes in 1993, another important test that was Dover test. And in Dover test, court act as gatekeeper. Although these two tests, I have simply concluded in two, three minutes or two, three sentence. It needs lot uh, detailed, detailed deliberation, but I have paucity of time. So I stop here, but let me talk how these tests penetrate about the probity of any evidence. So these are the two thumb rule. One is the reliability and another one is the validity. Understand what is the reliability? Reliability is the factual accuracy behind a procedure, behind a test. Factual accuracy, how to test? Suppose if you say that H2 plus O2 provide H2O with some, you know, temperature, a, a given temperature, given pressure and all. So that kind of experiment can be conducted maybe in England, maybe in US, maybe in 2003, maybe 2006. So it can be reproducible. So what you say, if it is reliable, it can be reproducible. Right? It is not as if that I did it. I don't care if somebody else gets the same result or no. No. The same result should be with given circumstances. It should be everywhere. So consistency in your result would bring trustworthiness in the evidence. So reliability is very important. Then comes the validity. Reliability, once you prove, then comes validity. Because validity is important for courtroom procedure. That, that mean to, I mean to say that reliability is precursor to validity. You cannot jump to validity first. First establish reliability and then go to validity. What is validity? Validity is basically foundational or conceptual generalization or theoretical generalization. However, this validity is very difficult to calibrate. I understand that what I said probably may not be very clear. I will give you one example by which you can understand. Say, for example, everybody of us think that polygraph test or say, for example, narcoanalysis test, they are very good tests by which we can find out whether a person is speaking truth or not. And suppose if you are conducting that test, it may qualify reliability test. Because in every case, you may get the factual accuracy, but everybody get precipitated and all whatever it is, right? But now the problem is that no theory could tie up physiological change with deception. This is the problem with these tests. And that is the reason why deception detection technique, be it polygraph test, be it narco, or be it electroencephalogram, that is brain mapping. So all these tests are not evidence per se in the courtroom. They can give you only some, you know, light so that you can proceed. If you can get some more evidence, then it is good. But per se, uh, standard alone, these evidence has no. Uh, this is DNA. 
let me just in five minute i will brief and then i will close this part and i will come down to innocence project because dna is very important uh, this is genetic information this is genetic witness dna and this is a double helical structure uh, it was invented in 1953 by watson and crick they were being awarded uh, by nobel prize and this gentleman is very important for us dr alex jeffrey who belongs to uk from lancaster university and interestingly he was a postdoc fellow in 1970s that time he was using dna for human identification but not for the purpose of crime or court room what he did what he was proposing or or uh, doing basically he collected blood sample of his uh, laboratory assistant and two of his children and he was trying can dna help to connect father with the children this was the objective right and exactly on 10th september 1990 for he got the eureka moment and in on chromatographic gel they got the same band so this is the first information by which he invented that dna can be a important tool for human identification to connect parents with the children and because fingerprint was used for human identification that is why he took dna from the genetic material and fingerprint for identification so that new term he coined was dna fingerprinting so this was first then comes in 1990 85 the uh, another milestone basically at that point of time a ghanian lady was living in uk in england in 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 london particularly and she brought a child from he her native place and the immigration authority thought that the child does not belong to him her there was a dispute so the defense, the lawyer with the lady he requested that look dr alex jeffrey has brought new technology can we ask him to help whether this child belong to this lady or not the immigration authority accepted this proposal they went to alex jeffrey and he conducted profiling or dna fingerprinting and that match with the mother and and uk immigration authority accepted that report and allowed the child to enter into uk so this was the first utility of this dna fingerprinting in civil matters then comes the crime in 1986 so 1984 1985 1986 the third landmark the third, third landmark was very important for us where i want to to take you to innocence project <laughs> at that time in 1985 83 and in 1985 two adults and girl were being killed of age 13 14 year old they were being brutally raped and killed almost in the same manner and the distance was almost stone throw they were very close uh, placed the both the both the place of occurrence and they were both cold cases mr brown was the detective he could not disclose the case so he went to alex jeffrey and requested that whether you can help us to identify the culprit you just see that time this technology was completely new has no business with the criminal court but they took the challenge a lot of money was required and dadan uh, prime minister of uk uh what was the name of the lady prime minister uh she allotted huge fund for this purpose and more than 5500 people were 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 screened and when you collect sample that is called dragnet when a, a so population is being 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 asked to give some kind of sample for forensic that is called dragnet and this this dna dragnet completed nearly 5500 people A very important incident happened when this dragnet exercise was on. A person sitting on a pub disclosed that 
on behest of my friend, I have impersonified and given my blood in his name. And this was heard by the pub owner. The message was conveyed to police. The man was caught. And prior to that, one incident was happened, which is very important to mention. One fellow, uh, Richard Buckland. Richard Buckland was of age 17, 18. He was caught by Brown. He was having some speech impairment. He accepted to commit second incident. You just see sometime accepting commission of crime may not be true. I will tell you in Innocence Project also. So he was brought to court, but his version was inconsistent and court said that probably he's not, but he was not given clean sheet. Now when DNA was conducted, then first DNA was conducted on Richard Buckland. So the Alex Jeffrey found that number one, Richard Buckland is not the culprit. So he was exonerated. This is the first case of exoneration or proving innocence, right? The second point, what he said, that in both cases, the accused is same, the culprit is same. So these two things were proved. Now comes what we I was talking about the pub business. So the person was caught, his name was Colin Pitchfork, and he was his blood sample was taken and it was matched with both the cases and rest is the story. And 30 year of, of, of uh, imprisonment was given. And recently in the month of March, probably he had been, no, not March last year, in September he was released. So this is how our forensic setup and and i i share you few things which i observed uh, one lady who was coordinating my visit to san diego she took me to a, a place crime lab mind me i have read this term in various you know literature articles and all crime lab but i never thought that what crime lab could be so she took me to crime lab I thought that there may be a, some laboratory or something. So there was a huge building. I thought that maybe a floor or so may be dedicated. But once we reached there, there was a uh, you know foundation stone or something. I took a photograph and then I realized, oh, this is a complete building is kept for, meant for crime lab. So different persons took me different segments where the interrogation and all cutting story short. The, the the entire you know investigation system including forensic science forensic examination laboratory and all were kept under one roof and you don't believe that the the samples collected from different crimes they have kept preserved right from 1931 mind me 1931 i asked this question why have you kept since long more than now more than 90 years broadly. They said that maybe tomorrow, like DNA came and at that point of time, various cases came like Sam Shepard case was very important, which where his wife was killed, Marilyn Shepard in 1953, and he was exonerated after DNA came. Otherwise he was punished for life imprisonment and he died in jail. But his son brought this case for DNA uh, uh, DNA testing and he, it was proved after his death, uh, nearly 20 years after his death, that he was innocent. So they said that these samples we are preserving that so may, uh, maybe tomorrow some technique may come and somebody who has been convicted may be exonerated or otherwise. Somebody may not be found or maybe a cold case, tomorrow some technique may come and he may be booked or 
at least be identified even if the person is not live. And another important book, so these three books I thought to share with you. Another is Junk Science. This is written by Chris Fabricant. He is also very prominent, you know, advocate of Innocence Project of New York. I had good talk with him, uh, had good time for two, three days. I was with Innocence Project. And this, this gentleman has freed many persons who were on death row, life imprisonment and all. So these three books I suggest. And although I can talk more, but I know the limitation of time. So please ask question those who have because nearly 10 minutes left. And I thought it is prudent to give time to the audience for any question answer session. 